I don't know why I call this first one activity three. Maybe it was continuing from a previous lecture. My memory is shot on this. So the first one, a manufacturer of flashlights suspects that the new process has reduced flashlight longevity. With the old process, let's assume you have totally standard batteries or something. I made this up. I don't know how they do flashlights. This is a made up example. <coughs> but it works to teach the concepts. With the old process, flashlights had a mean duration of 653.2 hours, and now a random sample of 40 flashlights, um, there was a mean, this is a sample mean, on average only lasted 645.1. That's smaller than 653. Uh-oh. Has our new process made our flashlights more crappy? Now, to set this sucker up, I'm going to use this, this, this ruler thing up here. Um, we've got 6.53 is the old duration, and the new duration is 6.45.1. I'm not even going to put the new sample on there yet. I'm just going to put the null hypothesis. So, according to the null hypothesis, so mu zero, so the null hypothesis is going to be, well, no, there's been no change. Nothing new is happening here. The, the process hasn't changed anything. Our flashlights are just as good as they used to be. But the null hypothesis, and that's the null hypothesis. The alternative hypothesis will say, no, uh-uh, something terrible has happened. Our flashlights are bad now. So we put the null hypothesis mean up there, 653.2. I hope this is high enough res resolution that you can actually see that small-ish writing on that board. So 653.2. Now, what is the true population mean that we are interested in estimating? This is really important. I'm putting this, this slide up before we get to everything else, before we even get to setting up your hypothesis test or anything, because you have to understand what numbers you're actually interested in. What is that true thing? So what population is our sample from? It's not just all flashlights, it's the new flashlights, the flashlights from the new process. So we are estimating the population mean of the new process. Now this gets confusing because our null hypothesis value came from a different mean, but that mean isn't part of this at all. There, there's not two, two population means here. Really, in the math, there's only one. There's, there's mu sub zero. But we got mu sub zero by looking at the mean before the processing happened. So our hypothesis, the null hypothesis, is that the new mean is the same as some number. Well, where did we get that number? Well, we got it from this old mean. But it doesn't really matter where we got it. It's just a number. So but that gets confusing because there will be multiple means and multiple things going on. You have to keep track of which of them are important for your calculations. So the population mean that we are estimating is the population of the new process. It's the mean duration of all flashlights, all flashlights. Now our sample doesn't have all flashlights, it's only got a few, um, by the new process. So, now we need to talk about whether this is a one-tailed or two-tailed test. One-tailed is sometimes called directional and two-tailed is called non-directional. And This has everything to do with the alternative hypothesis. The alternative hypothesis isn't ever going to give us a number of what they think the mean is going to be, not in classic hypothesis testing like this. It should, but it doesn't. It's just going to tell us a range. It's going to say my alternative hypothesis, we start with null hypothesis. The alternative hypothesis is that the true mean is greater than that. That's a directional test on the positive side, a one-tailed hypothesis test, because the null hypothesis implies an entire sampling distribution. Now, can I do this without everything falling down? I did before I turned on the camera, but that means nothing. All right, fine. I'll use tape. I want it to be all slidey with static clean, like in the olden days, but that's not working for me. Maybe because of this stupid wintery thing. All right, so there we go. There we go. There's our distribution according to the null hypothesis right there. Sampling distribution of the means according, not the distribution of raw scores. Sampling distribution. We don't care about the raw scores anymore. Um, so, a directional hypothesis going this way that says, I hypothesize that the true mean is bigger than 653. That's 
one-sided, directional, one-tailed, positive. But if we say, I hypothesize that the true mean is less than 653.2, then that's also one-sided, directional, but it's on the negative side. We could also have a two-sided or non-directional or two-tailed hypothesis test. That's where the alternative hypothesis is. I don't really know which way it is, but it's, it's not this. It's different, so it could be here or here. So for a one-tailed test, we take all of our alpha, it's like a one-sided confidence interval. We only look at one side, this side or this side. But for a two-sided test, we take our alpha and split it in half and put it on each side. The two-sided test looks like a confidence interval because it has two sides. So in this case, oh yeah, that was, that was super effective power pointing right there. There we go. Our hypothesis is, so I'm gonna, I'm just gonna draw something up here. The alternative hypothesis says that the population mean of all new flashlights, flashlights under the new process, is, to, is lower than 653.2. But we can't just say a teeny bit lower. That's why we have to do a hypothesis test, because from random sampling, we could have gotten a little lower, a little higher. We need it to be a lot lower, so much that we don't really think it was a random sampling thing, that even with random sampling, that's unlikely. In other words, we use this distribution table, this distribution, these probabilities, and we say, if it's really unlikely to have happened by random sampling, then we don't believe it was random sampling. We believe something is actually going on. So anyway, um, hypothesis testing steps. I, I have these steps. steps. So you, you write out your hypotheses. You draw a diagram. Here's the diagram. You find your critical values, which is going to be a T critical value or two. If it's a two-tailed test, you have two T critical values, the plus and minus of the same number. If it's one direct, a uh, one-tailed or directional test, then you only have one T value, and um, or critical T. Then you calculate your T observed. This is where you do the math, right here. This is where the math happens, and this is a table, the T table. You look it up, and then you compare the critical to the observed T values and you make a decision about the null hypothesis. This is all about the null hypothesis. I think of the null hypothesis as being like the bad guy. And even though everybody wishes we could just talk about the good guy, or I'm saying, I'm being so heteronormative and androcentric here. So it's a villain. And I wish we could talk about the hero or heroine, but we can't. We just talk about the villain. And if you defeat the villain, then the hero or heroine's like, yay, I guess I won. But if you don't defeat the villain, then the villain wins. I mean, it's kind of, I don't know. I don't know if this metaphor is helping at all, but we don't even talk about the hypothesis we really believe in. We don't test it. Well, we talk about it a little bit, but we don't test it. We just kind of go with it if we don't support the null. We only test the null hypothesis. And so then our conclusion down here, I can't see where I'm pointing with my finger. I have to use the pointer pointer. Our conclusion is when we write out a statement that says, what did we find? What are the results? What do we believe now about these hypotheses? So let's just be clear on what we have. The sample point estimate is 645.1 hours. The sampling distribution of that estimate is all possible sample means from a sample, mean, sample size of 40. It's T-shaped, so we're going to use the T distribution. You have to always know what the sampling distribution is. Otherwise, none of this makes any sense. This is our sampling distribution. And it's the sampling distribution of the mean according to the null hypothesis, so it's centered right there. That's where it is. <coughs> the mean of that sampling distribution, we know what it is. Our sample point estimate, I haven't put it up there yet because I don't know exactly where it goes yet. Um, but here, the sampling distribution mean is 655.3. And the standard error, the textbook, I, d I follow the textbook here. Maybe it makes it less confusing. I use square root of 40, not square root of 39, which is probably technically more correct, but it gives you incredibly similar results. It's probably not a big different deal at all. Um, so the sample standard deviation I told you was 30.6, and so we divide by that by the square root of 40, and you get uh, the SEM, 4.84. Now, when we do a confidence interval later, we can just reuse that value because it'll be the same and we can reuse whatever t-score we find. So writing out our hypotheses, that's, that's what we're out, right? We're writing the hypotheses. We usually write them in words and then also in symbols, in math. So it's always h0 colon 
my null hypothesis is an HA colon. Okay, so the average flashlight longevity has not changed. I could have worded this a bunch of different times, but it, different ways, but it has to be something like this. There has been no change. The, the new process produces the same longevity as the old process, something like that. There's no change. It, there's no difference. And then this is the average flashlight longevity has reduced. This is a one-tailed test. We use the word reduced. We're not interested in looking for possibilities on this side of the distribution. We're only interested in possibilities over on this other side of the distribution. By the way, I don't, I've been assuming you can see that board, but that board is in a tiny little thing here. So let's just switch back to look at the board a little more carefully. All right, so you can see that I've drawn this distribution here. This is the sampling distribution according to the null hypothesis. So this is the null hypothesis mean value right here. And I just, and you don't have to do this part, but just to remind us, the alternative hypothesis is that the true mean is somewhere to the left, something smaller. It's a smaller number of hours. Now, we know our sample actually found a smaller number of hours. What we don't know is, is it enough for us to believe? Like, if it's really far away, then that'll be enough for us to believe that this wasn't just a fluke, that this wasn't just a sampling uh, variation issue, that there truly is a mean difference in the population, that the new process is worse, <laughs> makes crappier flashlights. <coughs> but um, the alternative hypothesis is that it's lower. The null hypothesis is that the true mean is actually this, and that our sample came from here. All right, now switching back to PowerPoint here. So we've written out our samples now, or written out our hypotheses. Now the hypotheses are always written out, starting the same way, h sub zero colon, h sub a colon. And you notice this, so I called the mean of new, sometimes I say true, like the true mean, because it's just a stand in for whatever population value we're trying to estimate. But new, like new process. I use subscripts a lot to remind myself of what I'm doing. This isn't like some special way of doing things, just subscripts are little like little footnotes about what this means. So the new manufacturing process longevity mean, according to the null hypothesis, it's the same as the old one, 653.2, right? There's no difference. But according to the alternative hypothesis, it is less than that. Now you could use less than or equal to, but there's no point. We're talking about probability distributions that have infinite, infinitely small little bars. It's like a, it's like a histogram or a bar chart with with bars that are infinitely small. So the difference between less than and less than and equal to is like no difference. So we just make it easier. If you do less than or equal to, it's not wrong. It's just we don't bother usually. So the, the alternative hypothesis is that the new mean is somewhere to the left of this. We don't give it a number. We just say to the left, to the right, or sometimes to the left or the right at the same time. Now here's this diagram. <coughs> and the area, how many are the area we're looking for is 0.05 because we decided that alpha equals 0.05. So this here, that area that we're looking for, if we find a T observed in here, we will reject the null hypothesis because there will be a 5% probability or less that our sample mean could have occurred if the null hypothesis were true. So we call this area, and we set it up before any calculations, we call it alpha. This is called alpha. If there were two tails, then we'd then alpha would be both tails, and each tail would be half of alpha, or alpha divided by two. So this is this is our diagram here. So I'm gonna leave that there, and I'm gonna kind of update. So there's 0 0.05, so there's alpha, and it goes infinitely down forever. And there's gonna be some value here, and that's gonna be T critical. So the value that defines alpha, the, va the cutoff value for alpha is T critical. So let's, uh, so can you even see here? Yeah. Is that helping at all? That's kind of crazy pants. Well, maybe you can see slightly better. So I put a little mark for T critical. We don't know what it is yet, but we're gonna look, look it up in a table. And this is alpha. 
here. So just trying to make my diagram look like the one I have on the computer there. So let's go back to PowerPoint. So that's our diagram. Now we need to look up the t-critical value. Crap, I already forgot everything. What was in here? We need to know alpha and n for degrees of freedom. Okay, so alpha is 0.05 and n is 40. Sample of 40. Okay. Let's go back here to the table. So n of 40. Um, yeah, I'm going to... I don't remember if I did this right, but degrees of freedom is 39. So we should be looking in this right here. And 0.05 in one tail. I think that's this column. So I think we should be finding this. Is that... Is that what I... Yeah. Yeah, negative 1.68. Yay, go me. So we looked that guy up on the table. We found our T critical is negative 1.68. I'm going to write that in here, negative 1.68, I put a little, my labels are in weird places, this isn't nice neat diagramming unfortunately. So that's our diagram, always draw this, always set this up, it makes everything easier. Now the calculation, this is in a weird order, sorry about that, it's an old arrangement and I don't have time to redo all my powerpoints. So the sample mean minus the null hypothesis mean divided by the standard error, which we already calculated. Um, so the sample mean is this, 645.1. The mean according to the null hypothesis is this. So T observed is 4... Oh, sorry. The standard error is 4.84. So T observed is negative 8 divided by 4.84. So T observed is negative 1.67. That's what we finally come up with. That is really, really close but no cigar. So, remember that that's the standard error we looked up before, we did before, we didn't, yeah, we already knew that. So this is what our diagram looks like now. Our T observed is just barely inside the kind of inside this area it's not out in the tail so we don't reject the null hypothesis from t critical on out to like infinity away from the mean is called the rejection region which well colloquially i don't know if it's an official thing we call it that a lot because that means if your sample means t value falls in there then you reject the null hypothesis, <coughs> which is what we're constantly trying to do, reject the null hypothesis. Well, usually, almost all the time. We can use these tools for other things, but that's what we're going to use them for most of the time. So, the p-value, so alpha, we said it before, it's 0.05. The p-value is if we had a good t-table that did all these calculations for us, which we don't, So, but a computer will do it. The p-value is 0.051. That's the area from t observed out to infinity. Alpha is the area from t critical out to infinity. And so since t observed is slightly closer to the middle, closer to the mean, then there's a little extra bit of area there. So it turns out p is 0.051. So when you use your computer, and you have your computer do a t-test, you compare your p-value to alpha. Your computer won't give you t-critical. Uh, it will give you t-observed, but it won't tell you if that's good enough. It'll give you a p-value. So you say, my, my, my p-value is 0.05, and you compare it to the p-value that your computer gives you. If it's greater than alpha, sorry, you are not rejecting the null hypothesis. If it's less than alpha, then yes. In this case, we do not reject the null hypothesis. We fail to reject. Sometimes we say retain the null hypothesis. So we write some kind of conclusion. Now at the end of the conclusion, we always put these statistics. We always put T for whatever degrees of freedom. Sometimes people put the degrees of freedom in parentheses if they can't figure out how to do subscripts. That's actually pretty common. I like subscripts, anyway. And I know how to do them, so most of the time, depending on the software. So T for whatever degrees of freedom is equal to, and this is your T observed. That's T observed which you don't have to write out anymore because everybody knows that's the only T you would bother reporting. T observed is negative 1.67 and you put P 
is less is greater than 0.05 see because p is 0 0.051 051 is greater than 05 0.051 is slightly bigger than 0.05 so p is greater than 0.05 so we did not reject the null hypothesis so the evidence does not suggest so what we what the null what the alternative hypothesis said is oh flashlights have a shorter average life now well then we did not support that so we have to use this weird walking around language. You didn't prove that it's not true. We never say prove. Um, we support one hypothesis or the other. That's it. And we accept one of them, which doesn't mean we proved it. It just means that's what we have to believe with, with, with our limited evidence right now. We might change what we accept later if we have a better study. We probably will. So the evidence does not suggest that the new manufacturing process produces flashlights with a shorter average life. So this here was basically the alternative hypothesis, right? And so we just said we did not support that. The evidence does not support that, that assertion right there. Now, confidence interval. Let's find a 90% confidence interval for the sample mean. Why 90%? Because we already did most of the work. Because if this area is 0.05 and wait, negative 1.68, we can just put a positive 1.68 over here, have another 0.05, and then the middle is 0.90, right? So we can just reuse our t-statistic and reuse our sample, and we definitely reuse the, the SEM, the standard error of the mean, and we find that confidence interval. Now, I want you to see what's happening here because this is actually important. We've got our sample mean was right here. So We put the T observed and the T critical and everything, but that green line is where the sample mean was. This is the sample mean, 645 point something. The confidence interval is this. Da -da -da -da. There. That's the confidence interval. And then we just go find this and this. That was. Now, notice, so that and that, those are going to be the confidence, oh, you can't even see those. So, this and this. Those are going to be the confidence limits, the lower limit and the upper limit of the confidence interval. Confidence interval is about the sample mean. It's not about the null hypothesis. Hypothesis is testing is kind of just putting the confidence interval over the top of the null hypothesis mean at the confidence interval here we've got oh man this is 48 minutes long this is going to be a long couple of lectures i assume or two medium lectures i'll split it up i hope so the confidence interval is just putting this whole st setup over the top of the sample mean and finding those numbers that fit so let's switch back to powerpoint and do that Uh, we had the mean of the null hypothesis. That's not what we're going to do anymore. We're going to use the sample mean, just like we did on this little diagram up here. So the calculations are easy. We've actually done most of them already. We already know. Since I was lazy, I just chose this. I figured out 0.05. If I put 0.05 on both sides, that's a 90% confidence interval. Yay. I could have chosen any one, but then I would have had to look up another T value. I'm so lazy. Okay. Confidence interval is just a sample mean plus or minus. It used to be Z, but now it's T. And the standard error, which we already know. We know this is the standard error. We don't even have to do this. So, and we know that the T is this. So it's just easy to figure this out. It's the T is 1.68, standard error is 4.84. So we figure that guy out. It's plus or minus. It's a sample mean of plus or, plus or minus 8.13, I believe. Maybe if I did this right. So 637 and 653.2. So, uh, oh yeah, because it's within rounding error. It's very, this is very close to the, hypothe the null hypothesis mean. It's slightly greater. So the null hypothesis mean is inside this. It's like 653.1 something something. Um, so technically, yeah, the null hypothesis mean was plausible as a place where the sample mean could have come from. So we could have done the entire hypothesis test this way, which would have been easier, but... Where's the fun in that? 
we already knew that. Okay, new new activity here, and let me just erase some of this stuff up here. We don't need any of these values right now. Nothing that's written here matters any longer. Okay. Let me just stick this down here until we need it again. <coughs> so we're looking at depression scores from um, 87 Dutch teenagers who listen to early 2000s emo music. Now we know a population mean, but not the standard deviation, so we know the population mean for all people is 10.6, so the null hypothesis is going to be that that's the true population mean of the teenagers also. So, I mean, that's really what's going on is do the teenagers have the same mean as the general population? Um, but look how this is phrased. Do the emo teenagers have a different level of depressive symptomatology? Are they like either more depressed or less depressed? Could go either way. The researchers weren't clear. They're like, our theory doesn't really tell us, but we do think something's going on there, maybe. Alpha equals 0.05. So the teenage sample, we find a mean. Of course, it's a different mean, slightly more depressed, well, slightly less depression, 9.3. And we have a standard deviation. So what are we estimating? What population is this sample from? This is the, the teenagers, the emo teens. That's what we're estimating. We have another mean. That other mean of 10.6. We're not doing anything about that. We just used previous research on the full population to get our null hypothesis value. But that's, that's not the distribution we're interested in. The distribution we're interested in is the Dutch teenagers. We're going to assume that they have the same mean as the general population uh, uh, because that's the null hypothesis. But that's not our alternative hypothesis. Our alternative hypothesis is different. So I'm going to put mu true. The, the true mean that we're interested in is the mean depression score from all Dutch emo teenagers. <coughs> so is the null hypothesis one-tailed or two-tailed? We don't know. Well, we don't know if it's going to be greater than or less than, so it's two-tailed. We do know it's two-tailed. There we go. So it's a two-tailed alternative hypothesis. Did I say null hypothesis? Okay, the null is always, you know, it's whatever. The, it's a two-tailed it's a, it's a two alternative hypothesis. The researchers are open to the idea that the emo teenagers can have a higher or lower um, depression score than the general population, which they probably should have figured out before they calculated their sample because that can bias you. Um, you're, so here's some steps if you want to follow them along with the steps. So step one is always writing out your hypoth hypotheses. But you notice we already did some stuff. I, I think step zero is figuring out the whole situation. So step one, you write out your hypotheses. I wrote them out in words here. The Dutch emo teens have, an, have average BDI2 scores, like the same average as the Dutch population, this average. And then the alternative, they don't. So it's just not alternative is not null and that's a way to put it to make a two-tailed al alternative hypothesis just not the null so the null hypothesis is that the emo mean is 10.6 which we got from the general population it's the same as the general population and the alternative it's not equal to 10.6 why why do you have to do that to me that's, that, that looks so ugly so we charge on ahead our sample point estimate is our sample mean. In this case, BDI2 scores 9.3. The sampling distribution of the estimate is all possible sample means from sa all possible samples that each have 87 teenagers in them. So this is, the, the population is all emo teens. It's the BDI scores of all emo teens. So the mean of the sampling distribution is the null hypothesis mean. And the standard error is the standard deviation, which is 11.2, divided by the square root. I, I use that method from the textbook again, 1.2. So this is our diagram, and I'm going to put that little guy up here again. I'm going to use my little slidey thing, because I like sliding it. You know, the sliding thing is cool. So we've got markers that I'm misplacing in various random and interesting places. So this is... The mean, I'm making my means wrong. That's the tail that goes down. The mean there is 10.6. And I'll show you this in a second here. And 
we looked up our T critical values and that was negative 1.99 and positive 1.99 and so yeah it's over here and then we have another T critical I don't have to put the plus but I'm going to put it at 1.99 I'll show you this in a bigger I mean, I'm just basically copying what's going on in this diagram here, right? This is the same thing. Uh, yeah, so I, I made my diagram. I drew my little thingy here. The null hypothesis mean is 10.6. I looked up my T critical values. There they are. I'm going to find if my sample mean falls inside or outside. I can't tell until I turn my sample mean into a T score. And that's what the formula is for. That's the T observed formula. So I'll find a T observed, which is my sample mean as a T score. It's like my sample mean secret life as a T score. Let's find out what it is. Rip the mask off. Oh my goodness, my wife just saw this thing on Twitter. And I can't stop thinking about it. The reason Batman's mask only covers half his face is so the cops know he's white. It sounds like there's some truth to that. Anyway. As much truth as there is in made-up comic books. So let's see. Let's get back to this. There, that's what I'm trying to do. We looked this guy up. We found that our T critical was 1.99 because we're interested in 0.05 alpha, and but in two tails, so we want 0.025 in each tail, and this is. Uh, about as close as we're going to get. If your degrees of freedom are not represented here, if you fall between the gaps, you go with the lower one to punish yourself and make life harder because lower degrees of freedom make it harder to reject the null hypothesis. So we go with the lower one, which is really 1.99 versus 1.98. Not a big deal, but we, we do that. So we did 1.99. Now the calculations, the sample mean minus the null hypothesis mean and over the standard error. So the standard error is going to be 11.2, which is our sample standard deviation, square root of 87, because we, we could do square root of 86 to be technically correct, but the book would say square root of 87. So the standard error of the mean is 1.2, and the difference between our mean and the population mean is negative 1.3. So in other words, the Dutch emo BDI mean is 1.3 points lower than the population mean. So negative 1.3 over 1.2. T observed, that is not going to be rejecting the null hypothesis. Negative 1.08. So I'm going to put this up here on Mr. Diagram. It's just diagram, not Mr. Diagram. So the Dutch, this is T observed, negative 1.08. So, there we go, T observed. It's inside the tails, it's not, it didn't make it. It didn't escape the gravitational pull. I wore the hat because of the bald spot. I'm getting a little like, bald spot. I'll, I also wore it because, you know, it's coronavirus quarantine and technically I took a shower, but like, why should you do anything with your hair? My wife knows what I look like. My daughter loves it when my hair is fluffy and ridiculous. It's her favorite thing, so I put on a hat. Anyway, let's switch back to PowerPoints. All right, so we found our T observed, and our T observed is not in the tail area. Wait, what just happened? Oh, I'm not on the right screen. That's what just happened. It is not in the tail area there. That's the standard error. So this is with a two-tailed test. This is the actual T observed that we calculated. But because we, you don't have to know this, by the way. You should kind of conceptually know this, but you never have to do this for calculations. And yeah, that's fine. So the T observed that we find here was negative 1.08, right? Well, if you want the math to work out right, computer will do this for you, you don't do this. If you want the math to work out right, there's another T observed. Since you were looking on both sides, you would have, you would have also accepted something positive. So conceptually and logically, they reassure me that this works. You should have put an implied T observed that's the, uh, the mirror image on the other side of the distribution. So if you want to get the actual p-value, that's what you need it for. So the p-value is twice this p-value, this area that's over here. So the p-value is always the area from T observed. It's the purple shaded region, which overlaps the red shaded region. Alpha is 0.025, and that's from T critical. So 
or sorry, half of alpha is 0.025, alpha is 0.05. So half of alpha is this red shaded region here. The other half is on the positive side. It's this red shaded region. But T observed tells us where the p-value is, and the p-value is what we actually find. So our true p-value is 0 0.28, 282, and our true alpha is 0 0.05. So if you did this on a computer, all you would get is T equals negative 1.08, p equals 0 0.28. And you would say, well, before I started this, I decided that alpha was 0 0.05, because the computer doesn't know that. You, you decide what alpha is. I decided alpha was 0.05 and two-tailed and everything. And my computer told me computers always do two-tailed tests unless you do fancy stuff to make them do one-tailed, which I think Jasp can do. I'm not sure. You can say 0.28 is a lot bigger than 0.05, so I fail to reject the null hypothesis. FTR, man. So we failed to reject the null hypothesis. And you can say it's because uh, the absolute value of T observed is less than the absolute value of t critical and it was in a direction that made sense or because t observed follows outside the rejection region which is the saying the same thing or you can say p is less than alpha this is the one that you need to focus on because the computer is going to tell you this computers don't deal with t critical or anything like that they just tell you a p-value so we would write a conclusion um, the assertion that remember this was the alternative hypothesis right and so we're just saying what happened with the alternative hypothesis. The evidence did not support it. And then we put our T with its degrees of freedom and P less than whatever our alpha was. This is the alpha that we chose when we started. P is greater than alpha. You never want to see P is greater than alpha. You always want to see P is less, but alas. Now find a 95% confidence interval. Now again, we did a, we did 95% in our for our um, hypothesis test here so this is easy because this is this is 0 0.025 in this tail and this is 0 0.025 in this other tail so the middle is 0 0.95 it's a scribble that didn't need to be there so reminding you of what's going on here we just take this little guy here and instead of leaving it centered over the null hypothesis value, we slide it over and we put it over the sample mean. Now these T criticals, those are for the null hypothesis. They don't matter anymore. But the null hypothesis, that matters. What was the Dutch emo mean? Like nine point something? Anyway, um, it was nine point whatever it was. So we put our sampling distribution over our sample mean for the confidence interval. And then we find the same limits. Like we just find this limit and this limit. And when we find those numbers, that's our confidence interval. Notice our null hypothesis will be inside that, but we already know that. We failed to reject the null hypothesis. So if the sample mean was inside the confidence interval for the null hypothesis, then the null hypothesis has to be in the null hypothesis mean has to be inside the sampling distribution for the for the sample the for the sample sample mean. I can't speak for the sample mean. So going back here, let's go work out the oh it was nine point three. I knew it was nine point something. Nine point three. Ooh. windy dome and I kind of like loosened up all the coverings because it was getting warmer and so they're flapping around a bit <coughs> so the confidence interval this is too much work you didn't have to do this you already knew that t critical is 1.99 because I was lazy and I chose a 95% confidence interval and you already know what the what the um, this uh, standard error of the mean is it's 1.2 so 1.99 times 1.2 is 2.39, so it's 9.3 minus that, and 9.3 plus that, 6.9, and 11.7. So, so we would say we are 95% confident that the true mean of all Dutch emo kids 
uh, BDI2 scores is between 6.9 and 11.7. All right, next activity. This is a Roman funerary inscription, which I cannot read. Ixtic Zuntone. I can't even pronounce it. Okay, my wife can read it. I can't. So the standard Roman pattern of funerary inscriptions, you don't even have to know what that is. I'm just setting something up here. It's, it's all going to boil down to one number. That's all you have to know at this point. The standard pattern is found in an average of 92% of tombstones per cemetery. So the, the, the cases, the items of, of interest are cemeteries. Not people, not tombstones, but cemeteries. And it's percentage of inscriptions. So the standard pattern is found in at average population mean of 92% of tombstones per cemetery throughout the empire in the late empire period. I can't quite remember what that is, but anyway, it was a thousand, a couple thousand years ago, something like that. My wife knows these things. I looked this up before I did this, and it was only a few months ago, and I already forgot it. Some archaeologists suspect that Roman influence was waning. That's a word we don't use much, but it means it's, being re it's going down, it's reducing. That Roman influence was waning in Turkey, which was part of the empire, but it was the edge of the empire at this time. So they studied the excavations that they found of 36 Roman late empire cemeteries in Turkey, people who were buried during the late empire period in Turkey. And then they each for, for each cemetery, they calculate a percentage of standard type inscriptions. And the non-standard ones, those are going to be like non-Roman influence, right? So they're going to use that to, to test this hypothesis. And they find that the sample mean, this is a sample mean, 80, it's percentages, which is weird, but let's just pretend it's normal. 87.1% of the cemeteries in Turkey, that's the mean number of, per, it's not the percentage of cemeteries, it's the average percentage per cemetery of standard inscriptions. And the standard deviation is 12.5%. So we have those sample values, mean 87.1, standard deviation 12.5. Does this study provide evidence of waning Roman influence in Turkey during the late empire? Alpha equals 0.01. All right, let's uh, get the diagramming going here. I gotta undo this diagram. I should probably move it to the left, to the right. Yeah, I think our numbers are gonna be kind of to the left, so. Maybe I should put it back on the right where it was before, kind of over here-ish. So we're going to set up our sampling distribution according to the null hypothesis. And the null hypothesis is probably going to be something like, no, there was no evidence of waning influence. So it'll be the same influence as before, which was what, like 92%. So according to the null hypothesis, That's going to be too small to read. I'm just going to write a big 92%. 92% according to the null hypothesis, I think, if I remembered that correctly. So let's go back. So what is the true mean that we're trying to estimate? True mean of what? It's a little complicated, but that's why I did this one last. It is a little complicated, but that's fine. The population mean is the mean percentage of cemeteries across like say let's say all of Turkey because they only got 36 of them there's a lot more cemeteries in Turkey during the late empire period than 36 I'm guessing like hundreds or thousands so what's the mean percentage of inscriptions per cemetery in Turkey during the late empire period so that's what we're trying to estimate the true mean we're estimating is the mean percentage of standard Roman inscriptions in Turkish cemetery from the late empire period kind of complicated but it's important to keep that in mind. Yeah, I can reduce that in my mind to like all Roman cemeteries during that period versus Turkish Roman cemeteries. So the mean we're interested in estimating is just the Turkish cemeteries. And this is going to be a one-tailed hypothesis test because we are interested in whether influence was waning. Our hypothesis, we're only going to look on the left side of this distribution. So once again, the alternative hypothesis is only on one side. The alternative hypothesis, the mean according to the alternative hypothesis is somewhere 
to the left, and I'll show you a close-up of that diagram again so you can see what I just did later in a minute. Um, so then we can set up our hypothesis test. Sample point estimate, our mean is 87.1. I'm not putting it on my diagram yet because I don't know if it'll be inside or outside my little cutoff marks. I want to put those on first. I want the critical value first. The sampling distribution of the estimate, the distribution is all possible sample means from n equals 36, assuming the null hypothesis is true. The mean of those is going to be 92, right? The mean of the sampling distribution is 92%, 92. I'm just going to ignore the percents until the end because it's just numbers. So the standard error is our standard deviation, which is 12.5, divided by the square root of n. Like I said, it could be square root of 35, but our book would say 36, fine. So 2.08. That's our standard error. And we can use that for the test and also for a confidence interval. So the, the null hypothesis is that the average inscription, the average percent of standard inscriptions per cemetery is 92%. And we just got a weird 36. We just got a weird sample and it looks a little lower, but it comes from a population where the true average is 92, right? That's what the null hypothesis says. The alternative hypothesis says, nah, -uh, the true population value is lower than 92%, and so our sample is telling us the right thing. Actually, you set these up before you collect data. You're supposed to. I'm doing this kind of in a weird order. So math mathiness, remember, this is the same, this is the same, this is the same, this is the same. Okay, I'm going to scribble this out because that's not helping. Null hypothesis, you can set them up. Mu, null hypothesis value. Alternative, mu, null hypothesis value. The only difference is the math symbol. Equals less than in this case. It could be greater than. I didn't do any greater than ones in this case. Oh, whatever. So we're going to look up our t-critical and our n here is 36 so our degrees of freedom is 35 and what did we say alpha was? Alpha is 0 0.01 so it's 0 0.01 one-tailed And, and 35 degrees of freedom. One tail, 0 0.10, not that, 0 0.05, 0 0.05, 0 0.01. So if we made it two tailed, it would be 0 0.02, which would be weird, but we're just going to do 0 0.01, one tailed, so it's going to be down in this column, and 35 degrees of freedom. So there we go, 2.44. And it's and we're interested in being on in our sample value being to the left of the null hypothesis value lower than less than so we're going to make that a negative 2.44 so this is where our diagram is at right now 0.01 is like kind of small here so I'm going to put it like there ish I'll put it there uh, that would be 0.00 So all that area there under the curve is alpha. And T critical is negative 2.44. So we need to find out what the T value of our sample mean is. By the way, the T value of the mean is always 0. T is 0 right here. So I should have made this higher so I have multiple rows so I could put T values and raw score mean type things. Anyway, that's what we have right now. And we need to find out where our sample mean fits, so we have to calculate t observed to learn that. So here's our t distribution. t critical is negative 2.44, as I put up on the board behind me. We calculate t observed. The sample mean, the difference between our sample mean and the null hypothesis expected population mean, mean minus mean, apples to apples divided by the standard error. We knew the standard error was 2.08 already, so we could just skip all this stuff. Our sample mean is 87.1. The null hypothesis is 90, 92. That difference is negative 4.9. Oh, that's looking good. Negative 2.3. No. We needed negative 2.44, didn't we? 2.35. Did we fail to reject everything? Maybe. Eh, not such a great variety of examples. Um, anyway, so P... Let's see, do I have a nice, oh no, I don't have a nice diagram. I'll have to use the by hand diagram. I didn't do a cool computery diagram for this, so. So, 
our sample mean here negative 2.35 so our sample mean when we turned it into a t-score it turned into negative 2.35 we needed negative 2.44 that was the number to beat that's the end zone that we got to get the ball into that's that's the, the the horizon to get out of the gravitational pull of this crazy huge weighty massive null hypothesis we didn't make it so the null hypothesis as far as we know that's what's going on here so there is not enough evidence to conclude now this remember this area from our observed value on out is called p that's the p value our alpha is what was it 0.01 so p is greater than 0.01 did i get that right p is greater than alpha which is bad we don't like p to be greater than alpha dang it so our conclusion would be the inscriptions on the tombstones in these turkish villages do not provide evidence of and then this is the alternative hypothesis and then we write something out that says blah 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 didn't happen the alternative hypothesis didn't happen oh dang Sorry, T equals negative 2.35, and I should put my degrees of freedom, 35 degrees of freedom. P is greater than 0.01. So bummer deal, man. It was a bummer. Now for a confidence interval, phooey. That's, that's 0.01 in there, right? So if we put another, like if we put plus 2.44, then we'd have another 0.01. And then we'd have a 98% confidence interval, which nobody wants. Nobody wants a 98% confidence interval. So instead, let's do uh, a 99% confidence interval here. So 35 degrees of freedom and 0 0.005 in each tail, and which means 0 0.01 in one tail. So we couldn't reuse our T value. We can still reuse our standard error, and we have to reuse our standard error. So 2.72, plus and minus 2.72. So I'm gonna do that thing again, even though it's long and drawn out. But repetition might help. Okay, this no longer matters because this was all for the hypothesis test. This is just hypothesis test stuff. This is not confidence interval stuff. put this over here this was these t values don't matter anymore because these t values only only mattered if the null hypothesis was the middle of the distribution so once we're no longer assuming the null hypothesis so this is 87.1 and this is 92 right this is the null hypothesis mean so we find 1% on each, or a half a percent on each side. So this area here, from here on out, is 0 0.005, and this area from here on out is also 0 0.005. We can call that alpha, but with confidence intervals, we're really interested in the middle, so this is 0 0.99. That's what's really going on here. We've got a 99% confidence interval going on. So we calculate our 90%, 99% confidence interval for the sample mean, which is 87.1. That looks like a 2, but that's just a 7 with one of those crosses through it, which my German teacher in high school made us do all the time. So we calculate that out. We can still reuse our standard error, but we had to use a different T. T for alpha divided by 2. Alpha divided by 2 is 0 0.005. Alpha is 0 0.01. So alpha divided by 2 is 0 0.005. That's the T we looked up. This doesn't mean divide T or something. It shouldn't, just means the T the T that we found. If you did it right, then this is the right T. So, there we go. T times the SEM. So we end up with the sample mean, plus or minus, you know, 2.72 times the SEM. 5.66, plus or minus from the sample mean, and we end up with this, 81.4%, 92.8% there. Wait, did I even switch back there? No. Okay, anyway. <laughs> Let's look at this again. Uh, this is how you calculate this stuff on out. 
I forgot to switch over and show you, but anyway, you can see the calculations now. I'm going to switch back to me, back to me, back to me. Okay, so I'm hoping this clarified a little bit about how to do single sample hypothesis tests, and sometimes I ask you to do a confidence interval. Most of the time, except for maybe one homework, uh, the computer does this for you. It does the hypothesis test and the confidence interval. You need to look at the computer output. You need to set it up correctly and think correctly and set your alpha in your head correctly. And then when the computer says P equals whatever and T equals whatever, you need to be able to figure out if that means reject the null hypothesis, retain it. You need to be able to write a conclusion and report the results. So the hard part is always thinking things through. The calculations are easy. It's four things two of them on top, two of them on bottom, divide by each other. It's the easiest algebra ever. Um, the hard part is which four things? Which do you plug in there and when? And how do you interpret the results? So, I don't know, watch lectures like this, think through it carefully, do the practice quizzes, maybe that will help. And over and out, I think we're finally done with this one.